there's been a lot of speculation on the new and Anu and Neberu or Nibiru and what does it mean. But the half of the story that hasn't been told is found in the teaching of his imperial majesty. First, we're going to touch on the new. What is the new? New, an Egyptian term referring to the mothers and fathers of the great beyond, beyond the fringes of the known world. The land of Cush or Nubia, located further upstream along the Nile, what we call today Ethiopia, and even furthermore to the root in South Africa. But all of that land in ancient times being known as Ethiopia, the ancestors were the sons of Noah or Noah, Kam, Cush, and Mitzrayim. Now, according to ancient legend, the sons of Noah settled at the headwaters of the Nile, a place that the ancient Egyptians regarded as the source of all life after the time of the Great Flood, which the pyramids are witness to the Great Flood. They were not built after the great flood but actually before the great flood that's also half of the story that hasn't been told until now now the next point that we want to touch on on the new so the new are the mothers and the fathers who are referred to as the mothers and the fathers now how does this connect with the teaching of some pearl magic we have to know the roots so we have to go to Nubia Nubia the land of gold. In the earliest times of recorded history, ancient Egypt was the great civilization of Africa. To the ancient Egyptians, the land of Kush was a kind of a no man's land or ancient Ethiopia. Ancient Ethiopia was thought to be a kind of a no man's land beyond the fringes of the known world. An important point the ancient Egyptians viewed the quote world or the known world as being Egypt or that which was within what they knew to be Egypt. Adventurous Ethiopian traders would brave the journey up the Nile to get their legendary cargoes of gold and ivory and precious gems from Ethiopia, from the source. Since gold came from Kush, the Egyptians began to refer to it as Nubia, which means the land of gold. As the descendants of Noh migrated down the Nile Valley, the Nile River Valley, and with them went the vanishing knowledge or gnosis of Yahweh, the one true Elohim, or the one true God, also known as Yahweh or Jehovah, the God of the ancient Israelites. This is where the modern day reference to Jah finds its origins. Before long, worship of Noch, one true Elohim, was limited to a very few elite or enlightened families. But through Aksumawi, the great great grandson of Noah, worship of Yahweh survived in relative isolation, immune to the numerous other cults that were worshiping nature spirits and supernatural forces and demons promoted by the surrounding native tribes or uninitiated and unenlightened ones. It was no small accomplishment that Aksumawi established a monotheistic or one true God culture in the ancient city that we know as Aksum or Wag Shun. 
the use of the Egyptian name Amen is interesting. This Egyptian name Amen was used as a prenom for the ancient Egyptian kings and later as one of the primary gods, Amen Re, also spelled Amon and Amun Re, was brought down the Nile Valley into Egypt by the descendants of Cush, who retained a glimmer of the light of Yahweh, the one true Elohim. Amen in ancient Egypt meant the hidden, the holy one. The name Amen Re meant the God who dwelt within the king. In ancient times, it had a glimmer of the Tawahido principle to it. Resemblance to the Judeo-Christian Amen or Amen, a blessing to divine, is also very very striking. Now the earliest reference to Amen appears in the pyramid of King Unas. Amen is included among the primeval gods associated with the new, the fathers and the mothers from the deep beyond, in the beginning, in the Berasait or the Berashit in the beginning. The deep beyond, it refers to the Semayat, it refers to the heavens, to the deeps, or depths of Africa, which to the Egyptians would be Nubia and beyond Ethiopia. Could it be that through the creation myths, which exclude any mention of the great flood, that the ancient Egyptians are remembering their ancestors, the sons of Noh, who came from the source of the Nile. The source of the Nile, the Hapet, which was the lifeblood of the ancient Egyptians, was fearfully revered by them. One Ethiopian conqueror later achieved his victory over ancient Egypt by threatening to divert the headwaters of the Nile and thus destroy Egypt. Also very interesting in connection with the rivers and their source in ancient Ethiopia is the fact that the inundation what's known as the inundation of the beginning of the floods from ancient, the highlands of Ethiopia in ancient times began on a very important and special day, especially for Rastafari prophecy, that the inundation of the Nile actually began in ancient times on July 23rd. And we know now that July 23rd is the earth date or the birth date of the son of man, of Lich Teferi, of Rastafari, of Kedamawi Haile Selassie. So we have this connection now with July 23rd, connection with Ethiopia, connection with ancient Egypt, connection with Yahweh worship from the sons of Noah. You see what I'm saying? This is very a very important link right here, but we want just to give you some of the basic foundation, some of the basic teaching on this. Let's just conclude this right here that Egypt was split into Upper and Lower Egypt early in the late kingdom period, around 1075 BC. One uh, dynasty that ruled at Tanis in Lower Egypt is where Aten or the Tedal, the disc of the sun was worshipped, and the other at Thebes in Upper Egypt where Amain was worshipped. At this time, Nubia or Kush created a separate state upstream with a vital trading port at Napata as its very capital. 
This was just prior to the time when the Queen of Sheba and her only son, Minulik I, Kedamawi Minulik, formally established the Aksumite kingdom or the renewed kingdom of David in Ethiopia. All right, there's been a lot of speculation on the Nu and Anu and Neberu or Nibiru and what does it mean. But the half of the story that hasn't been told is found in the teaching of his imperial majesty. First, we're